my way of creating impact had to somehow be incorporated into what it was I was doing for a living. And that had not been the case. I just started to think about what can I do with my skill set that would allow me to make a greater impact. And that necessarily involved changing what it was I did every day for work. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We explore how you can innovate through creativity, compassion, and collaboration. I believe that innovation combined with compassion and creative thinking can save the world, and I aim to bring you ways you can do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you can support it by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a cuppa at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm your host. And I'm super happy you're here. And I'm also incredibly thrilled and honored to welcome today's guest. You're going to love this person. Ah, Josh Klein is a multiple startup founder who's led social impact startup Have Need since 2017 with the goal of leveling the playing field for people in need around the world. Josh spent the prior 20 years working in media technology before segueing into the social impact space. How amazing is that? He started his career in film and TV production before co-founding production tech startup Sample Digital. You might have heard of that one, where he developed digital dailies, which revolutionized the review and approval process in the production industry and for which he was awarded a 2013 Primetime Emmy Engineering Award. From April 2014 to March 2017, Josh served as head of media and entertainment at Box.com. Josh lives in L.A. with his wife and teenage son. Josh, I'm so glad to meet you. Welcome to the show. Likewise, I'm so glad to meet you. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. I'm so fascinated and curious about your career trajectory. You went from media and technology and working in in the entertainment industry to going, okay, you know what? I'm going to go into the social impact space, and I'm wondering How did that happen? What drew you from the one to the other? Well, I think the driver for it isn't all that exotic. I think the vast majority of people want to feel like they're contributing back into their communities um, or the the greater community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my wife and I do that. Like a lot of people, we donate to causes we care about. We volunteer for things that we care about, but I got to a place where I didn't think I was making a significantly large impact. Mm. You know, I I wasn't curing cancer. I wasn't solving giant problems. I was just doing enough to feel that I wasn't a totally selfish putz. (laughs) And I felt like there had to be a way I could do more Mm -hmm. Um, and, but, you know, I was pretty busy. And so the way to do more, I thought was really about finding a way to make, um, you know, my, my way of creating impact had to somehow be incorporated into what it was I was doing for a living. And that Mm -hmm. had not been the case. And so I just started to think about what, what can I do with my skill set? that would allow me to make a greater impact. Mm -hmm. And that necessarily involved changing what it was I did every day for work. That's where it started. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, sorry. I was, I was thinking, uh, it's fascinating to me, uh, that you had the self-awareness to go, okay, I want to be more active in this and and rather than try and just throw money at it you stepped back and you went okay what do i need to change in what i do in myself in order to make this greater impact that i want to make where did you get that self-awareness how did that come about well i think if uh if i had been an entrepreneur with a measure of success at the you know, massive level, Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm, I'm a working entrepreneur and, and I've done fine in my career, but you know, had I sold the company for a billion dollars, it would be a different discussion, mm. right? I would have vast sums of capital to deploy into areas I thought were important. Um, it, so I just, I didn't have that particular luxury. Mm -hmm. So, so if I wanted to create bigger impact, more meaningful impact, um, it was going to have to be through my own labor. And so I was confident in my, in that I could do that. And so that, that led me into really this, um, sort of a thought exercise about, well, okay, I've got, I've got this sort of general technologist and, and business skill set. Mm -hmm. And then it was really around trying to figure out what the opportunities were, like wh where are the, you know, the old phrase, the low hanging fruit, right? What, what's the low hanging fruit? Who, where are the easily identifiable opportunities mm -hmm. to create impact? And it led to, uh, you know, the knowledge of the next couple of billion internet users that'll be coming online. You know, these are people largely from developing economies that will have smartphones and internet access, but uh, really not great access to currency or banking systems. Mm. And that creates its own problems. I, well, how do you, how do you help a population like that where, um, they don't really have cash. So how do you have that? Helping people without cash is one thing. Making a business out of it is something altogether different. Mm -hmm. And so then I uh, just was sort of working through different, uh, different scenarios where I thought there'd be a way to uh, make a business out of that. And I thought, um, I'm sorry, I'm just shutting down a notification sound on my computer because I hear it coming <laughs> through my head. I don't know if you heard it. I heard it. I heard, a, my head. I heard a buzz. <laughs> yeah, that was me. Sorry. No worries. No worries at all. <clears throat> so um, it, it led to, uh, uh, by the way, the other part of this is that I didn't come from the nonprofit or the NGO side of the equation, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so people who come from that side of the tracks uh, have a very different mindset. And, um, and I work with a number of them and they dig into uh, giant problems and they rally a lot of people and organizations around them and they tackle things in a very different way. I didn't have that experience. And mm -hmm. so I wasn't comfortable tackling these issues, uh, in that way. And so I had to figure out how to create a for-profit entity that could address these problems and, um, that ultimately led to me focusing on bartering, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, when you think about a lot of people, like, uh, you know, billions of people with smartphones and internet access and no money, there's only so many things that, that you can do. And bartering seemed to me to make a lot of sense. Uh, and then I had to figure out why hasn't, uh, consumer level bartering been hugely successful that people have tried it but there's never been a, a really significantly successful startup that offered consumer bartering services and so um i had to research why why the ones that had come before had not succeeded at any scale mm -hmm. and and then i ran head on into um just some basic economic concepts and the big one is something called the mutual coincidence of wants. And um, this came through some discussions with um, a, a Harvard economist, actually, that I was lucky enough to connect with. And um, it's not that I'd never heard the mutual coincidence of wants. It's just something different when a Harvard economist is bashing you over the head with it. And that is, if I need something from you and you don't need something from me, we don't share a mutual coincidence of wants. Mm -hmm. So there's no barter to be had. There's no trade. And uh, that's a really difficult uh, sort of bedrock concept to get around. <clears throat> and, that, and that is why most barter efforts fail. Because even in the internet age, 
when you can uh, have a sort of a barter marketplace with many participants, you still have this issue of the mutual coincidence of wants. So it's just not all that common. Uh, it's very uncommon that, that two people have directly offsetting needs. And that led to, um, <clears throat> this is, this is the, the moment of innovation for me, which was, well, what if we could connect multiple parties in a transaction? Wouldn't that necessarily sidestep the main friction point of barter? And that's how I got to uh, the concept of multi-party barter transactions. And uh, in fact, it does, uh, it does sidestep the main friction point of barter. It's not that there aren't friction points along the way uh, in other areas like any business would have, but the main, you know, the knife in the back of successful bartering has always been the mutual coincidence of wants. So we've, we've addressed that in a really significant way by uh, creating a platform where you can have, um, you know, technically speaking, you could have an, you know, any number of people in a transaction. We limit it to five people in what we call a barter loop. Mm -hmm. And when you can uh, have multiple people in one transaction, uh, the sky is kind of the limit, uh, especially when you have enough people in that marketplace, essentially, that have listed their haves and their needs, um, the, the opportunity to match people up is, is pretty incredible. Um, and if, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll give you a mathematical example of I love it. What, what happens. So when we do uh, software testing, uh, just you know, new releases, bug testing, things like that, you know, we've just got a small set of uh, test users, uh, personas in the application. And it's, it's six users and each user has five haves and five needs. And when we uh, recently ran a report on how many you know, legacy barters that creates, so one-to-one -one, directly offsetting haves and needs, mutual coincidence of wants, uh, we get 11 possible transactions. Six users, five haves and five needs each. We get 11 possible transactions when we are able to include up to five people in a barter loop, um, that number climbed to 3,279 possible transactions. Wow. With the same number of users, exact same halves, exact same needs. And so we are orders of magnitude uh, more efficient about creating possible transactions uh, when we you know, deploy this type of architecture. That's incredible. Uh, that I'm fascinated. Okay. So when you create a barter loop, it, it sounds to me, and I have no idea, maybe I'm wrong. Does this, is this something that people have to be close to each other? in order to hand off the things? Or how does how does the infrastructure for that work? If you have something I want, but Betty has something you want, and that something is able to be transferred from one person to another, how how do the transfers of, of the items work? Sure. So, you know, once, once we get past that primary friction point, then we deal with all of the other logistical issues that any other marketplace has to okay. deal with. Okay. So it goes from, you know, the Craigslist level, which is you're on your own, uh, all the way to, you know, when you look at eBay, who's been around for a long time and they've, you know, their logistics options are, you know, pretty well ironed out, right? Shipping, uh, You've got your integration with PayPal and the transactions are insured. So that's a pretty smooth operation. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're targeting getting to. Okay. Uh, the, on, uh, upon our launch, we're, we're looking more like Craigslist. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, we are launching in our beta release uh, you know, imminently, days. <laughs> and wow. uh, when we do that, uh, it's what, what's called the minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. This is the, 
the set of features that we believe um, is the least amount of features to prove out uh, the hypothesis that this works, mm -hmm. that human beings will barter at scale if given an efficient way to do so. Uh, as we go along, you know, there's no lack of, uh, there's really no end to the features I wanna see incorporated into this platform. But among them uh, would be pretty simple things like shipping, escrow for higher value items, uh, local deliveries. And, and the good news is that you know, these are all third party services that we can just integrate. Like I, I have no intention of building these things. Mm -hmm. um, there are third parties that provide these services all day long to any number of companies. And we'll just integrate those as we go. But in terms of, um, let me add that this is a marketplace for goods and services. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that we've seen that's happened over the last year in a broad way was already happening in smaller ways. And that is the remote provision of services. And an example would be, I have a high school age son and two years ago, maybe three years ago already, it's the last year is kind of a black hole. Mm -hmm. um, he took, he started taking Latin as his foreign language requirement in school. Mm -hmm. And I told him that that was a, a likely a poor choice <laughs> because he had plenty of other difficult classes and he could have taken Spanish or French. We live in Los Angeles and you know, Spanish is always a good idea in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chinese is an available language at his school. I mean, I just thought there were more practical languages to take. I didn't, I didn't know what the benefit of Latin was going to be. I knew that it was going to be a very difficult class, uh, but he forged ahead. He wanted to take Latin and um, he was having difficulty. Wasn't going great. And so the tutor that came highly recommended to us uh, lived in New York. And so his Latin tutoring was over Skype. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching, uh, even at the high school tutoring level, remote education already. And I incorporated that type of uh, use cases like that into the Have Need platform. And when I would discuss that with you know, whether it's investors or friends, like here are ways we can use this platform. People would look at me like I was a little crazy. Like who's going to, you know, provide services online? Cut to, you know, the last year of our lives when we're doing everything online. Sure. And so I don't think I'll ever have to defend a whole bunch of these use cases again. We've, pr we've proven that they work. And so now, you know, it may be that I'm sending uh, or I'm handing off a pair of headphones to somebody in my neighborhood and they're shipping a pair of sunglasses to somebody in New York. And that person in New York is providing tutoring online to my son. So I think we've broken down a number of these, these barriers in terms of how and where we can provide services. And that, that benefits, I believe, what we're doing at Have Made. Oh, amazing. I, you know, it got me thinking this, this idea of mutual coincidence of wants kind of, it doesn't fly out the window, but it definitely becomes a lower marker of importance when you have this possibility of, well, I need sunglasses or I need tutoring for my son. That person in New York needs sunglasses. I can hand off the headphones and then it sort of it does become this really beautiful loop and the innovation of that strikes me because everybody feels like they're getting something they want and that that they value out of the interaction so agreed yeah that's 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 fabulous like i was thinking about it i'm like hmm if i could provide i'm a singer and i teach voice and if i could provide someone a voice lesson who could provide for me marketing, for example, or accounting, which I'm terrible at, uh, but they 
wanted something else and we could set up that loop like that, then that mm -hmm. it, would it be like an hour for an hour or a deed for a deed? How how does that work or is that up to the participants to decide? Right. That that unit of labor is really up to the participants. Mm -hmm. So if it's, you know, tutoring or music lessons or accounting services, um, it, it is, and, and the way you list a service is, you know, there are fields in there uh, as you list a service that allow you to describe that unit of work. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, I'm going to trade six guitar lessons for uh, an iPad, something like that. Like it's really up to the participants mm -hmm. to determine what that unit is. And it, 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 all of this boils down to perceived value as opposed to cash value, right? So you could say, well, you know, normally with my paid customers, the singing lessons are, I, I wouldn't even know, let's say that $100 an hour, whatever the actual number is, say it's mm -hmm. $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. And that iPad is that's a pretty good one, but it's it's really only worth a couple hundred bucks. So I, I don't know about, you know, let's say four singing lessons at $100 an hour, that's $400 for the singing lessons, the iPad's only $200. It doesn't really matter in a marketplace like this. It matters in a marketplace like an eBay, mm -hmm. but not in a marketplace like this. What matters is your perceived value of, do I have can I make four hours over the next couple of weeks work? Am I that busy right now? And do I really want that iPad? So the perceived value may be that I want the iPad enough that I'm totally willing to squeeze in four hours of singing lessons, right? It's not, it's not dollar for dollar. That's the thing about bartering. It's a, it's a different mindset mm -hmm. than a, um, a cash-based marketplace. Yeah, that's something that that it, I'm curious about because I wonder, uh, and perhaps in economies that are that have more bartering to them, will it be embraced more, more easily, or will there be any sort of discomfort that you're getting something for nothing, or or that you get what you pay for, or whatever cliche you want to use? Like, is is there? Have you done any research? And if so, what have been the results of the research of people's attitudes towards this sure well i've got a couple reference points to this and and one of one of one of the areas to look at is you know where does a barter marketplace fit in the broader spectrum of marketplaces mm -hmm. or ways of transacting and you know um let's say we start up at the amazon level of things and then you go down to eBay. And, and I, I had the benefit of being at um, uh, a leadership conference at the last company I worked at. And we had uh, this, the, at the time, the CEO of eBay came to speak mm -hmm. to us. And it was pretty interesting in that um, the surprise there was, was he'd asked us, you know, what percentage of, you know, you think of eBay as an auction marketplace, what percentage of things do you think are used and are being sold at auction versus new items? And the surprising answer is that 80% of things on eBay are brand new. It's just a different kind of a marketplace. And how, how eBay differentiates itself, at least at the time, I think it it's still holds true, uh, against Amazon is that they view Amazon customers as having more money than time and eBay customers is having more time than money, mm. right? So there's a differentiator between those two. And then uh, at, at the other end of the spectrum from Amazon, I would, I would look at things as, as a donation based. And um, there's this movement uh, out there called buy nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if mm -hmm. you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm and largely uh, done with Facebook groups and it's called a gifting economy. So there's no trading, no selling. It's literally just people in the community saying, Hey, I have this available or people saying, I, I need this. Does anybody have one of these things? And, and I participate in the, in my local one too. I've given away a few things. 
Um, somebody asked for it. I have it, I'm not using it. Happy to give it to somebody in my community. Mm-hmm. But there's this chasm between something I'm totally prepared to give away and uh, something I buy on Amazon or eBay. Mm -hmm. And in that chasm, I believe is where barter lives because there are some things I may not be using, but have enough value stored in them that um, I would prefer to get something of value in exchange for it. And sometimes that's cash, right? If, uh, if I need to pay my mortgage or my utility bill, I need cash. But sometimes what I need is another thing. And so normally I would take the thing I'm not using, sell it on some service, take that cash and buy the thing that I want. Mm -hmm. But with bartering, if we get to a place and remember, I'm, I'm just launching and this, this has got to prove itself out, but Mm -hmm. obviously I'm pretty biased. (laughs) Otherwise I wouldn't (laughs) have committed my professional life to it. Uh, But in bartering, if, if the marketplace, uh, if it's a thick enough marketplace, then I should be able to cut out the middle of that whole transaction. I Mm -hmm. shouldn't have to take one thing, sell it, get paid for that, and then buy the other thing. I should be able to cut out the middle of the transaction and just trade this for that. And I believe that there is this untapped market in between these services. So whereas I don't believe that have need is going to, you know, take out Amazon and eBay, you know, I, I, I view... I view the large e-commerce players as kind of the the tiles of e-commerce. And I think that have need and the bartering economy is, uh, would, would be the sort of the grout between all these tiles Mm -hmm. um, because it can take advantage of all the stuff that people buy and don't use. And that just exists uh, until it's, you know, thrown into landfills or shoved into a storage unit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's you know, I, oh, go ahead. please go ahead. Oh, well, it's it's interesting. What you're saying is so fascinating to me because there's a psychology at work here about being willing and able and interested in letting go of the stuff you have to begin with, right? So, someone who goes, "Oh, I'm not using this. I, I can use my husband as an example." He might not use it for three years, but if I try to free cycle it or, or buy nothing, he, oh, no, no, I might need it someday. So so what uh, what sort of research, if any, have you done in that aspect of getting people to be more comfortable, to increasing that comfort level with letting go of things with the expectation that you're going to get something you value back? Yes, of course. And you still have to be willing to let those things go. Yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll say I've done no formal research on this. Uh, the research I would cite is what I'm seeing, uh, especially in the last year mm-hmm. throughout the pandemic, with you know, free cycling is growing, buy nothing is growing, and those are just really community driven. You know, I've got this thing. I'd, I'd be happy to push it back into the community, right? So, those those are growing efforts. Um, in terms of specifics, uh, I, I I've been collecting articles, online articles from around the world during the pandemic, mm-hmm. and it's I'll just point to where they are. It's on the haveneed.org site on the news tab. And I have dozens and dozens of articles from around the world where communities are turning towards barter to get through this very difficult time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's pretty amazing to watch. And, you know, in the beginning, it was things like uh, sourdough starter, right? <laughs> I'd never heard of sourdough starter before, but then it was everywhere. But, but now it's, 
people are are utilizing barter as a way to get the necessities for their lives, food and services. And it's not just in one part of the world. It's it's in Fiji. It's in Ventura County. It's in Vegas. Like I, I these articles point out where this activity is happening globally. So mm-hmm. that that makes me feel that, um, you know, I've had the gut feeling since I started this that listen, barter was is arguably the first uh, first form of of commerce. And we're, we're kind of hardwired as human beings to do it mm-hmm. right from the time we're kids. I'll trade you this for that. And, and now when times get tough, uh, human beings are turning back towards barter. We're good at it when we have to do it. Uh, my goal is to make it actually really easy so that we don't have to, you know, be forced into it, but that it just becomes uh, a very simple thing to do. And it's useful. I, the, that's the thing that I keep useful is my current favorite word. Is it useful? And it is. It feels like it's very, it's easy to use, it sounds like. And I would like to get into the nitty and the gritty of that with you a little bit. But it also, it just feels like it's going to, you know, help people. I, I remember I was in, uh, in South Africa teaching when I worked for NASA. We were doing a workshop. And the people there who were from Namibia and and places like that, they had all just gotten cell phones and they'd never had landlines, but they all, they all of a sudden went from nothing to the ability to connect with, you know, towns and villages, you know, dozens of miles, hundreds of miles away. And amazing. It was incredible because it was, it was actually, they didn't crawl before they walked. They just started running. They did. And they (laughs) took off and what was interesting about it, and this is something I'd like to get your thoughts about, I was teaching, this is this is a little story, but I was teaching and there are 80 people in the room and I'm teaching about a NASA concept, blah, blah, blah. And the person, one of the people got a phone call and he started talking in the middle of the room, just got, got on his phone. And so I, at the end, uh, you know, I was like, do you mind putting your phone away? He's like, oh, I can't, I can't do that. And I said, okay, then can you leave the room? And he says, no, I don't want to miss what you're saying. I said, then can you put the phone away? He's like, no, 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 someone might call. And it was it was this interesting conundrum because on the one hand, he could, he was really interested in what I was saying. But on the other hand, this new technology was had changed everybody. And somebody told me afterwards, they were like, look, you need to understand, you cannot ask them to put their phones away. This is the first time that if somebody from a, a village 30 miles away needs to talk to them, that they don't have to travel hours to get here. So this is crucial. (laughs) And so I'm wondering about that with with you, with your work that you want to do in the developing world using have need this kind of connectivity. How do you believe it will play out from whatever economy is going on now, boots on the ground in, in some of these developing nations and developing regions? How will it play out when all of a sudden people have smartphones and can embark on on this new way of bartering much over these longer distances yeah so the the end game for have need was always about you know impact at scale and impact at scale being the billions of people in developing economies um you know sub-saharan africa is a perfect example and so everything uh, I'll, I'll come back to the economic drivers of it, but but everything is a business is is aimed at do what we have to do uh, in in the developed economies to generate revenue, so that we can pay for uh, a number of gratis services in the develop or the uh, the developing economies of the world. So it, it's kind of a one for one model in mm-hmm. software, right? So what Tom's was really known for, you know, buy a pair of shoes here and you put a pair of shoes on the feet of a kid in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's on the software level that that's where my head's at for this. Now, um, I've had the benefit of working with a couple of wonderful people that are based out of Melbourne, Australia, uh, that, that are deep in the impact space. So 
you know, extensive careers at Oxfam and the Red Cross and, and big NGOs like that. And so where I was, you know, uh, my work on the impact side was kind of theoretical going into this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I now have partners in the business who um, have decades of practical experience in that area. So we've got use cases that we're building for that um, are, are things that uh, my partners have direct experience in and, and know can benefit from this technology. So when we're talking about, you know, over distances, 30 miles away, well, somebody has a car, right? Somebody has got a vehicle or a means to travel and that's a service, right? So, so we have an expectation of you know, transportation as being a, a service that can be bartered in, in those transactions. So it could be part of the loop then? The, the, a absolutely. And the, okay, okay. Yeah, because they that, say, oh, go ahead. Yeah, as you say, in, in, in the, what, the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> well, in, you know, in, in the village, uh, where one guy's got a moped, he's king, right? He he can drive the thing to the next village, mm -hmm. but he's going to get something too. But now he'll have a platform to do that on where he can really leverage the value of his moped. Oh, <sighs> okay. So I, hmm, what you just said is very interesting because if if i were the person with the moped moped <laughs> moped see i think <laughs> ipad moped uh, totally. I, I i sit in technology probably too much so so if i if i were the person with the moped you would have to find something that i wanted enough to be willing to make the 30 mile trip from my from this village to the other village to go get the thing it 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 how Hmm. What if what if there's nothing? What if I'm I'm the person with the moped and in many ways the deal hinges on me because I'm the person who can go. And what if there's nothing that anyone is offering that I actually want to barter for? So we can't solve for that. OK, what, what we can do, as we talked about earlier, is you know numerically we can create orders of magnitude, more options uh, through this architecture. But what we can't do is create an option that you have to agree to if you just don't want it. Um, the way the the system works is, you know, nobody's obligated to anything. We we just surface options, mm -hmm. and if you have a high value item like an iPad, you're going to see. You know, we're not going to shotgun you know, 10,000 options at you in, in, in a jumble. But the way the app works is, is there's, there's a screen for this for based on your iPad will tell you how many options there are. And, and you just scroll through. It's like a dating app for your stuff. Oh, so you, if you have an, if you have an iPad to barter, you mm -hmm. would go, I have an iPad to barter. And then you would see the people who are listing things who want an iPad. And those are yes. the things that you, ah, okay, cool. And then you, and then you decide through all of that. And, and we'll show you the two person loops first, like mm -hmm. the traditional, the legacy barter. There are not that many of them, but if they exist, that that's a win, right? We're not anti two person barter. It just doesn't happen very often. Right. So We'll, we'll present those in the application first, and then the three-person loops, then the fours, and then the fives. And you just scroll through and find things that you would trade for. And you would then join one of those loops. Or say you have an iPad, you could join a hundred loops with that iPad. Mm -hmm. Now, the first one of those hundred loops where everyone else in that loop also joins the loop, that loop then becomes a closed loop and the other 99 loops you joined disappear instantly. So it's once very... you've chosen one, you're, you're well, in that 
Well, you've, you commit. Uh -huh. So you, you only join loops where you would do that transaction. Okay. Because right. you've seen something you would want. Yeah. So say there's, say there's a thousand loops that are available for your iPad mm -hmm. and a hundred of those just for round numbers and a hundred of them make sense to you. Like, yeah, I, I sure I would trade that. So you've got a hundred things that you would trade for of those hundred loops. If any of those loops, all of the other people in one of those loops also want to do that trade. The first one of those where the other participants also join becomes the closed loop. Mm -hmm. Essentially that loop wins because everyone joined that one first. And so all the other 99 loops that you were willing to to participate in, they go away because that one loop has won and it becomes the closed loop. So the system is very dynamic. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of churn happening in the background. Like we're creating and blowing away these loops constantly. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, it's not like eBay where you have a watched item, right? There's, there's not, there shouldn't be a great expectation that the thing you thought was really cool is going to be there tomorrow. Right. We, we actually want to see a velocity of transactions. We want mm -hmm. people bartering in real time or near real time. If I join a loop, I love the nitty and gritty of this. This is so fascinating. If I join a loop and everybody's like oh i yeah i could do this but then someone backs out does the whole loop break apart then and you have to go find other loops or how does how does that work yeah so of course we're going to get there somebody with a nasa background is going to dig into that <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh, but it, no it's all right it's a, it's a very real issue um sometimes people will not fulfill they're part of the transaction through honest reasons, mm -hmm. right? I was going to give the lessons and I moved out of town. Sorry. Right. And sometimes there are just bad actors out there and mm -hmm. we have to account for those. So we have a short-term solution and we have a long-term solution. The short-term solution is that as we're preparing for our beta launch right now, we are launching with private groups. Mm -hmm. And this is functionality that uh, was developed uh, through some of the, the early work we've done with Oxfam. And uh, it was uh, essentially a feature requirement for how they operate, which is, you know, the example was if, if we go into Haiti after a uh, you know, devastating earthquake and we're trying to help rebuild those communities, we can't, uh, and, and by using a barter platform to make those communities more resilient, we can't have gun traffickers, drug dealers, and human traffickers bartering within those groups because they will take advantage of those people. Of course. So we need to segment off those communities uh, into their own cohorts, essentially. And uh, so... Ultimately, we have need. We went away and we, we spent some time uh, building out what we call group loops, which is private group bartering. Mm -hmm. So if I'm if I'm in a group and I upload an item, it would either go into the public have need network where anybody can see it, or I would post that item, whether it's a have or a need, a good or a service into a group that I'm a member of. And so that only other members of that group can either search for that item or have it shown to them as part of a potential loop. And by launching with private groups, because barter is inherently a trust-based transaction, um, we, we have the trust built in. So the groups we're launching with include um, a couple of charitable organizations, a couple of companies, and a couple of neighborhoods. So essentially uh, an overlay of, uh, for instance, a, a Facebook neighborhood group and a next door neighborhood group. Mm -hmm. So in each of these groups, everybody knows each other already. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, in, in an affinity group, it's much less likely that somebody is going to renege uh, on an obligation to transact. And if they do, well, it's our beta launch and we'll, we've got some ways that we think we can address it, mm -hmm. but we are a startup. So we're not, we're not self-insuring these transactions. Um, the long-term solution is transactional barter insurance. Mm -hmm. That is an insurance product that doesn't exist anywhere in the world today. The good news is that we've already signed an LOI with an insured tech company uh, mm -hmm. and we are designing an insurance product. So we are heading towards a place where if you're going to send your iPad to somebody and you're hoping that the headphones show up from somebody else, um, if that iPad's important to you, you would, you would spend uh, a couple of bucks to insure it, the transaction. Mm -hmm. And if you never got the headphones, you would get the eBay sold value, recently sold value back for that iPad. That makes, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a really good way of safeguarding the people who are using the app, especially people in developing world who, who, for whom some of these items will be very valuable. I, I'm, I'm so happy that you're, that you've thought of that and that you're already doing it. I, I have one more and it's a, well, I have like six hours worth of questions and I know that you have a, a day to get back to, but I, I did I did want to know, and this is a potentially challenging question, when you're, when you're bartering for services, what, what about when people want to barter for services that are either illegal or potentially uh, fraught, shall we say? What, <laughs> what are the safeguards with, with, uh, with that? Yeah, so it, it starts with, it, it doesn't end with this. The, the, the entry point to the safeguard is terms of service, mm -hmm. right? No guns, no drugs, no sex. And that's easier to say than to enforce. Sure. Um, we are working with a, well, somebody I, I've worked with for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, but uh, there's a firm that provides uh, network security. And I don't mean like firewall network security. I mean, like when, um, when Craigslist got loose uh -huh. and, and they had to go in and clean that up, there were, you know, it was a lot of prostitution and there were a couple of murders. Like they really had to clean Craigslist up. Um, this was the firm that did that. Uh, uh -huh. the, the gentleman who runs this firm was the one that um, oversaw family safe computing at Microsoft and then News Corp when they had to basically clean up MySpace. Mm. So um, we, we, all we can do is the most we can do that's commercially viable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am comfortable that we've got the best team uh, around to help us monitor what's happening inside of our network. It's yay. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I have a niece who is a teenager and who has to sort of be uh, uh, course corrected quite often as far as <laughs> as far as some of the, the ways she used his technology. And, you know, so I'm really glad that those safeguards are that you're thinking about those and the, the, that those safeguards are in place. I mean, have any of these lessons been hard won? And I guess the question I want to ask is, what have you learned through doing this startup, what have, what have been the ups, what have been the downs, what, what has been the biggest lesson? I mean, I thought of this six years ago and so. Take your time. No worries. I can sing a little ditty. <laughs> just closing a door, closing a door behind me so I could hear that other phone ring. No worries. So, <laughs> These things happen. So, yeah. The concept of multi-party bartering was sort of the lightning bolt idea. Figuring out how to actually do it, uh, that's the hard part. And so for a platform like this, there's essentially a butterfly effect 
on just about everything that happens in this platform. And so it just certainly took a lot of time. I've worked with a, a number of people and teams along the way, and we keep coming up with unforeseen issues and we will keep coming up with them. So it's it's not that this, multi, it's like 3D chess, right? This, this multi-party barter thing is complicated mm. and um, it is unproven. So I believe wholeheartedly that this is the way to scale barter. I, I, I think this is the answer. I, I, I believed when I thought of it and I believe as I'm launching the beta test, that this is essentially cracking the DNA code for barter. Mm. Um, we'll see how it shakes out. Oh, I this is it's really exciting for me to listen to. I, I was I'm an immigrant. I was born in the Soviet Union where bartering was king and uh, and the black market was queen. So <laughs> it was it was an interesting it was an interesting upbringing. And yet you're. You, you, you're not a nonprofit, right? So you, you didn't go out and get grants from, you didn't do a bunch of development work with, with people who might, with like philanthropists or whatever. Right. So the question I have for you with this non-money bartering economy that you are setting up, <laughs> how how is Have Need going to make its money? So in uh, developed economies, this will be a service that charges transactional barter fees and, and not like eBay where it's a percentage of the transaction, mm -hmm. right? Because we're, I'm not interested in the dollar value of the items. Mm -hmm. um, these are barter, these are units that are being traded on this, on this marketplace. Mm -hmm. So um, I look at the old, the original iTunes purchase a song model and it came down to if, you know, in an era where uh, online music theft was rampant, piracy was absolutely rampant, but uh, quality was not uh, uniform by any means. The iTunes value proposition was if we could give you, you know, sort of a known quantity of value for the song you're looking for, and, and would you pay 99 cents for that? And the answer was a resounding yes. If people could get a high quality version of the song they were looking for and get it very simply, they would pay a buck for it. And so we've modeled out this business at a buck a barter. So if you were in a, a barter loop with, you know, if you and I were in a barter loop mm -hmm. and both of us fulfilled our obligations and that then that became a fulfilled transaction, we would each pay a dollar. And this business scales uh, profitably at that rate. And we'll have other premium services, like I mentioned the shipping and deliveries and escrow and insurance, but th those won't be you know, required services. Um, but the baseline revenue stream for this service will be buck a barter. Okay. And that, I mean, that makes, that makes all sorts of, it makes all sorts of sense. And I love that you use the, the iTunes system their their process because it was something that was crazy <laughs> that was music right? was, it just yeah. worked yeah yeah it worked brilliantly well especially since there was there were often albums you know it's kind of like the barter economy there's an album i don't want all the songs on the album i just want the one song that i love on the album and now i get to do that so absolutely what you, what you said earlier about it you know removing some of the friction is well the the point is well taken here in that you're removing the friction for people just about anywhere provided they can get the items to one another to be able to do these these bartering transactions and i, I this sounds kind of like a like a gimme but it must just feel really good <laughs> that you are that you are able to do this that you're going to be doing this for people who otherwise might not be able to access those goods and services that they need because they don't have the the cash money it will make me feel great uh, to see this fully realized um my my dream for this because you know i've raised some money and i'll continue to raise money and uh 
because it's a for-profit endeavor. But you know, my ultimate dream would be to see the commercial side of this business scale and likely acquired by uh, a large player, probably one of the large marketplaces, because this is a new kind of marketplace that's going to be competitive to their business. But to allow me to continue to run the uh, the impact side of this business, because I want to see uh, barter uh, marketplaces set up around the world in developing economies, because ultimately it goes back to the concept of leveling the playing field for those in need. If people can transact for goods and services, acquire goods and services using only their own goods or the services they can provide, well, their quality of life like increases dramatically. So that, that would be, that's the end game for me. That would be incredibly fulfilling. It really sounds like it would. I, there's a, there's a description from, from, uh, oh goodness. From each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's, it sounds a little bit like that, like that, that process of allowing people to, uh, develop their own systems for that transaction and you getting to then work with people who otherwise might not have these these items and, and goods and services that they that they might need is going to be incredible for you as a person and so as an innovator where do you see this going what would success look like for have need years from now even even if you no longer if you sell it to the, the mechanics of it to the Amazons or the Ebays of the world, what would it, what would success for have need look like to you years from now? Well, that it's, that it's profitable and continues to grow for one. Um, so that, that, that would, that would prove out the point that um, we've solved for the, the, you know, friction points of barter and you know, for me, uh, I, I look at, uh, I think Jimmy Wales is a, a great example of Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. When I started this, uh, I thought, well, if this works, nobody's ever going to have to ask me what I want to do next. <laughs> right. I don't think nobody asked Jimmy Wales what he wants to do next. Mm -hmm. He's the head of the Wikimedia Foundation. He runs Wikipedia, like the, the, the world's knowledge base. That's fulfilling. So success for me is that the business is self-sustaining, that it, that it generates some measure of wealth for the investors and for me and my teammates, and that it, that it scales and that it can deliver services, not only for people who can pay for those services, but for people who can't pay for those services and for whom it would drastically increase their quality of life. I, I mean, that is, that. that's a home run for me. That's fantastic. I love it. Well, it, so if people want to get in touch with you and learn more about Have Need, how should they do it? Where should they go? What's the, what's the best place to find about Have Need? I, I, the best place is, is going to be straight on our page and it's haveneed.org. And there's both on the homepage, a sign up form for people who want to be uh, on the waiting list and notified about our launch plans. And then on the, there's a contact form and, and that will find its way to me. If some, you know, I got, I got a great email yesterday from uh, a musician and music producer in Detroit who who'd read about have need. And he just said, I have two storage units full of music uh, equipment and recording gear that I don't use anymore. And I would love to trade this stuff for other stuff. Like, you know, when are we going? So That's fantastic. I, lo I love those emails. Those are great. So haveneed.org, either to sign up for the, the upcoming launch or on the contact form to give me your thoughts, ask questions. I love it. I, I'm going to sign up. Absolutely. You're, you're awesome. going to get my little... <laughs> 
I have things I can trade. I know I do. And I, and now I grew up in Detroit. That's where my family was placed when we came to the USA. So now I'm like, I wonder if I know that music producer. I might very well know that music producer, which would be really cool. Uh, and we might meet each other on one of these barter loops at some point. And, oh, and that's actually another question that I have to ask. The, I imagine that, that identity, as far as identification, has there isn't like a username and you never get to know the sure. person because you'd right. have to send it to them. Is that is that true? Yeah, so I'm I'm completely averse to anonymity on this platform. Okay. Um, I don't know that anonymity has helped our world all that much online of late, especially, but um, sure. is, especially uh, because barter is trust based, and um, this is uh, designed to be a community oriented platform. So, on launch. Uh, we require people to log in uh, with a Facebook account. And that's because it's the only social login mm -hmm. that that makes an attempt to make sure you're a real person, right? Because mm -hmm. using Twitter or Google, like, you know, I, I probably have 10 Gmail accounts. Sure. Like, it, it, it's not part of their business model to make sure you are who you are. Facebook tries. Um, we'll also be integrating um, some digital ID verification technology where, you know, once you're in, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily need a Facebook account, but, um, you know, we're going to verify through, uh, you know, selfie technology and, you know, taking pictures of identification that we can kind of put a check box or a check mark next to your name to say that we have identified, we have verified your identity. Ah, uh, that makes sense. That makes all sorts of sense. Yeah, I, I was, I was like, hmm. Let me think about that. That that's something that you'd need to know if you're going to be sending something to someone. You'd need to know who they are, where they live, and how to find them. Uh, Absolutely, Josh. I'm so so grateful that you joined me to talk about this. I'm super excited about Have Need and the incredible difference that you are going to make in the world. Really, I think it's going to be incredible. So. Yay. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. And if you need beta testers, you let me know. I've, I've done beta testing and I'd be there in a hot second. Uh, Zolda, I, would, I will absolutely reach out to you for the beta <laughs> test. Um, I'm, I'm honored that you had me on and it was an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. Really. I, I have, as I said, I could keep you here for another six hours and delve into the psychology of all this and really think about the innovation. But I'm going to ask you just one last question. And it's a question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. And it's an unusual question, but I find that it gives some pretty amazing results. And here's the question. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Try to leave the campground nicer than you found it. I love that so much. <laughs> I do. I'm, I, I worked at NASA in environmental education for over 20 years. So, so that is very, very close to my heart. The other one that I love is uh, take only photographs, leave only footprints. That's, that's another one of those. That's a great one. Isn't that great? Oh, Josh, again, I'm really grateful that you were on the show. I'm excited for Have Need. And you heard it here. If you want to get in on and sign up for the waiting list for Have Need, you go to haveneed.org and you get yourself on there because this is going to change the world. I'm convinced of it. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, your host of the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you, if you're liking what you're hearing, subscribe to the show. I'd love to hear what you have to say and how you feel about the innovation that we talk about here week after week. And until I see you again or you see me, actually, we're just hearing each other and you know that, I remind you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, 
I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.